um, to that effect. Anyway, uh, yesterday while we were doing the uh, pre-con, uh, one of my daughters sent me this, uh, texted me this picture, and I think this ought to be the theme of next year's uh, uh, conference. It says, am I rocking this extra chromosome or what? Um, <laughs> And, and I think that says so much what we try to do each day. We're going to talk about health issues and how we try to keep folks with Down syndrome healthier so that they can really rock that extra chromosome and be the best person they possibly can be in every which way they can. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And certainly we're going to leave time for questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to leave time for questions at the end so we can certainly uh, address other uh, concerns that you have. Um, we did a, a four and a half hour pre-con yesterday, and I think uh, I uh, ran out of time long before uh, we ran out of material. So in an hour and a half, we'll, I'm going to try to shrink it down and then uh, try to leave time for questions so things that we don't get, uh, that don't get answered, we, uh, you can ask specifically. Uh, I'm, uh, we're glad to be here in Washington, D.C. I'm from uh, Chicago, for those of you, uh, that's the uh, skyline in the upper left-hand corner, uh, and then the Millennium Park. If you've not been to Chicago and not been to Millennium Park, it's well worth the trip all by itself. Uh, that's uh, uh, our three daughters in front of uh, Buckingham Fountain. And, and my third favorite place in the world after my home, the clinic, and Wrigley Field in the right lower corner. For those of you that, uh, you guys can have the Nationals. We got the Cubs. So. Anybody can have a bad century. So, you know, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so let me start talking a little bit about the, about the clinic. Uh, the clinic opened and we celebrated our 20th anniversary this past January. About 21 years ago, the families of the National Association for Down Syndrome, which is the parent group that serves Chicago, although their name says national, they're not really one of the national groups any longer. They were national by default when they started because they were the first parent group in, 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 in uh, um, the United States. So that's where their name came from. Uh, so then, uh, uh, Sheila Hebein, who was the executive director of NADS at the time, came to the hospital and said, you know, we're getting good care for our children when they are children, but we're not getting the same quality of care for our children when they become adults. And so would you start a clinic for adults with Down syndrome? So uh, Advocate Medical Group, who, who is uh, my employer, and Advocate Lutheran General Hospital uh, started the clinic, ended up on my boss's desk, and I had uh, the most interest and the most uh, experience working with adults with intellectual disabilities, and so uh, I got asked to take it on. We started, uh, this is the hospital, um, and then up to about two months ago, this was our office, uh, and two months ago we moved into this new facility, which is about three times the size. Uh, we started two mornings a month, uh, and now we're very full-time. We have two full-time physicians, a full-time nurse practitioner, full-time doctor of social work, and we've seen over 5,000 adolescents and adults with Down syndrome, and we just keep growing. Uh, I've gotten, since I've been here, I've gotten uh, uh, four uh, tasks, what they're called in, the, in our electronic medical record from the staff saying, this person, this new patient's coming to see you uh, in the next couple of weeks. So it just, we just keep seeing new patients. Uh, just very briefly, I want to just talk about the mission of the clinic, just so you kind of have, have a sense of who we are. Um, it just as a, to enhance the well-being of adolescents and adults with Down syndrome by providing comprehensive, holistic, community-based healthcare services by a multidisciplinary team. If you've ever done a, a mission statement, that thing took about six months. Uh, every word was gone over 4,000 times. Um, I like to say, actually, I like to say that um, really what we're about is Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird says you don't really understand a person until you walk around in his shoes for a little while. I will never understand completely what it is like to be a person with Down syndrome, but as much as possible, that's what we try to do each and every day so that we can understand what our folks are going through so that they can, so we can help them achieve what they, it is what they're trying to achieve. Uh, we're not for not-for-profit entity. I, I uh, often uh, joke that the uh, healthcare system reminds me that, uh, uh, understands we will not make money. They do remind me periodically that we don't need to lose quite so much money. The other thing I think is helpful just to, uh, so we're on the same page, is, is uh, we use the World Health Organization definition of health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the, merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And so we really try to help people in, in all aspects of their life. We're certainly not a, 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 a job program or a, a residential facility or any of those things, but we do try to link people with other services so that they can be healthy in, in all aspects of their life. Now, one of the things when we, when we started the clinic, uh, we were typically asked two questions. Uh, by, by, uh, by professionals, the question was, why do we need an adult clinic? I didn't know there were any, which spoke very highly that we did need an adult clinic. And then families typically ask, uh, uh, do you have a son or daughter with Down syndrome? And the answer to that is no, but I think the real question they were asking is, can I trust you with my son or daughter with Down syndrome? And hopefully in the last 20 years, they, they would tell you uh, uh, yes. 
But uh, certainly there are adults with Down syndrome, as you well know, and you know, obviously I'm talking to the choir here, but life expectancy now is about 58, and it's gone up significantly. In, in 1900, the life expectancy of a person, average life expectancy of a person with Down syndrome was about nine. The average life expectancy of people without Down syndrome was in the mid-50s. So if, if all of us increased by the same percentage of people with Down syndrome in the last century, we'd be living to be about 350. So it's, it's a, dramatic, a dramatic change in the, in the last century. We actually had the privilege of serving one of the oldest, uh, well-documented people with Down syndrome. She died at age 83. We gave this presentation in Vancouver a couple years ago, and they contended that they had had a 100-year-old uh, with Down syndrome. I didn't see the chromosome, so I don't know. Um, there are some premature aging issues, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. So, this, so the second question was, do you have a son or daughter with Down syndrome? I've actually since discovered, uh, since we started the clinic, that I had a great uncle with Down syndrome. This is Leo Foley. Uh, that's in front of the old family farm in central Illinois. I was in that house as a child. It's now been torn down. But uh, Leo lived at home until he was 10, which was extremely rare in 1907. He then lived in a uh, residential facility in, in Michigan until he was 20, and then lived in state uh, institutions, if you will, until he, until he passed away. We have come a long, long way. My mother tells the story when she was a child. Uh, they didn't have a phone or a car, so they would have to go to the facility unannounced. And, and they would get there, and um, they would, uh, it would take about an hour. For, they, you weren't allowed to go see where Leo lived. It would take them about an hour to bring them to the, to where, to the front. My mother, even as a child, wondered, is it because they're cleaning them up, or it's because they can't find him, or both? And, and so it, uh, we've come a long, long way since, uh, since the 40s, certainly. So one of the things that I think that I think is real helpful when we, th when we think about the past and think about going forward in the future is, is looking at what I call two syndromes. Now, you won't find this written any place other than our two books because I made it up. So it, it's, it's not a scientific fact here. But uh, I, I think it's an interesting concept. Basically, when Leo was born in 1907, and when people with Down syndrome are born today, presumably the genetics are the same. Presumably, Leo had either trisomy 21 or mosaicism or, or uh, you know, had a, a, a translocation, but pr probably most likely he had, had, had trisomy 20, straight trisomy 21. Presumably, Leo had no congenital heart disease because that would have been extremely rare for somebody with Down syndrome in 1907 to live to 40 with congenital heart disease. But presumably, the genetics are the same today as they were when Leo was born. Obviously, Leo never had gen uh, genetic studies done, but uh, presumably the genetics are the same. But the interesting thing is when, in the past, when we would give these presentations, oftentimes the families of a younger person with Down syndrome would come up and say, you know, our life experience is very different than what you're describing than what, from what we were describing as some of our older families. And so we began to think about that. And one of the issues was expectations. So when Leo was born, it was probably, my great-great-grandmother was probably told, he will never walk, he will never talk, he will never, and lots of nevers uh, that they were probably given. Certainly that, hopefully, that's not what families are being told today. So, the expect, so right off the bat, the expectations are very different than when Leo was born. Certainly when Leo was born, his life expectancy was only, although he lived to be 40, his life expectancy was only about nine. So uh, it, presumably my grandparent, my great-great-grandparents never planned for Leo's adulthood, because they never expected there to be an adulthood. Uh, and actually, I gotta tell you a story that even, even about 18 years ago, we saw a, a, a woman with Down syndrome who was in her 50s, and she had been living with her mother who was in her 90s uh, in Arizona, and her brother lived in Chicago, and her mother, their mother passed away, and he came, the, the woman with Down syndrome came to live with her brother, and because of family circumstances, he really had had very little contact with her for years. And so he didn't know her, he didn't know anything, very little about her, and so he came to us really looking for assistance. Um, and, and I asked, I said, you know, wasn't there some sort of planning that, and they said, well, they told us she would never outlive her mother. Well, her mother was 90. <laughs> At some point, you think you would have figured that out. So clearly, from then, you know, from back in the, in the 50s when she was born, they were told that she would never, you know, life expectancy, so they never expected there ever to be a need for a, a transition plan. And clearly families are thinking very differently uh, today than they would have uh, back in the 50s. The other thing is opportunities. A lot of our older families, if their son or daughter went to a school, it's because they developed a school. If their son or daughter went to a rec program, it's because they developed a rec program, work programs, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly that's not the expectation of a, of a family today. Sometimes at a uh, staff meeting I'll say, you know, as we go forward, when we started the clinic, just the fact that they were there, we were there for people, and a lot, 
it, it was enough in some ways. You know, people were just so happy to have something that that, that was enough. Now, hopefully, we never just tried to just be there. I mean, hopefully, we gave the highest quality care we could ever. But going forward, families are going to expect the highest quality of care, like they should. I mean, that's what that's what they should get, and that's what they should expect. So, you know, that, going forward, the opportunities are much different than they were certainly when Leo was born. So certainly the goals are very different. Again, not planning for adulthood, not looking into work opportunities, not looking for post-secondary education, all the, all the things that are happening today uh, that were not happening certainly in 1909 uh, are, are, are things that are moving us forward. Now, we've got a long way to go, and, and I'm certainly not telling the, someone that doesn't know that already, but uh, I think that we're certainly heading in the right direction. The other thing that I think is real important that we've learned is, is what I call two opposite issues. And the first thing is all is not Down syndrome. Now, there's two, two pieces of that. The first piece is that everybody with Down syndrome is not the same. And again, that's no surprise to you. Um, but uh, that is, I think, to uh, some other medical professionals that you know, expect that everybody with Down syndrome is going to be the same. The second piece of that is that all that a person with Down syndrome presents with is not Down syndrome. And let me give you a very simple example. Two or three weeks after the clinic opened, I got a phone call. A mom says, my son has been to the doctor three times, and he has a cough, and the doctor keeps telling me it's just the Down syndrome. Now, I got to tell you, when we started the clinic, we knew very little about Down syndrome, and it's scary how little we knew. So I said, hang on one second. Went back through the book, looked, looked for cough as a symptom of Down syndrome, could not find it anywhere. <laughs> I said, come on in. Let's take a listen. He had changes in the lung consistent with pneumonia. He had a chest x-ray consistent with pneumonia. Treated him with antibiotics, and his cough went away. Now, he still had Down syndrome, <laughs> but his cough was fixed. Now, that's a very simple example. Dr. McGuire, our doctor of social work who spoke this morning, runs into this all the time. It's certainly in, in the psychosocial arena, this is even a bigger issue than it is in the medical arena. And so, Things that, you know, people just say, well, nothing you can do about that, that's just the Down syndrome. You know, sometimes it may be depression, it may be diabetes, it may be thyroid problems, B12, celiac, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to go look and to see if there is something that is there that, that is potentially treatable. On the other hand, there are common characteristics of people with Down syndrome. And it is really um, to our disadvantage not to understand those accept those and appreciate those. And so uh, Dr. McGuire again talked this morning about, uh, and, I, and I'll just talk briefly about it, but things like uh, self-talk. A lot of our patients talk to themselves. Uh, what Dr. McGuire calls the groove, where they have a tendency to do things the same and repetitiously. Those are things that are such part, part and parcel to so many of our patients that it's not only things that we don't want to discourage, it's we want to take advantage of. And if we try to discourage them, we actually take away some real compen you know, ways that people uh, compensate and work through their day. And so actually, not only are we not helping, we're actually hurting them by, by trying to uh, change uh, these common, some of these common characteristics. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. So, so we really want to look at, again, not all is Down syndrome, but there are some common characteristics, certainly not everybody with Down syndrome, but there are common characteristics, and we want to appreciate those and understand those if, if, if that's appropriate. Now, the other thing that I think is, is real important, and, and, and uh, this is actually, we were joking at lunch, that this is actually the first time Dr. McGuire and I have presented separately at this conference. And in fact, one of our patients calls us Dr. Shaguire. <laughs> so we're both Dr. Shaguire. So, and, and there's actually a fair amount of truth to that. That individual really has an insight that uh, perhaps is, is the rest of us have missed. But anyway, so. Um, when we work together, we usually present together, when we work together, this is, this is a key. In fact, I teach residents and medical students, and I say, you know, I get it, you've been up all night on call, you're gonna fall asleep in my presentation. If you're gonna wake up for one slide, wake up for this one, this is the one. And that's, any and all behavioral change should be viewed as a possible communication tool. Ooh. Something happened. Are we okay? Okay, so any and all behavioral change should be viewed as a possible, uh, is that too loud or too, everyone okay? Sorry, okay. Uh, I'll say it one more time. Any and all behavioral change should be viewed as a possible communication tool. And, and my piece of the, of the thing is that when someone, one of our patients prevents with a behavioral change or has a behavioral concern, it is our job to really look hard 
to see if there might be an underlying physical problem that is contributing to the, to the change. And we find things all the time. I tell myself this every morning when I wake up, and we miss things all the time, and we're looking hard. So we may not, so we may not see them on the first time, but sometimes it takes a little while to, to sort through these things. We've got to just keep digging. And so, uh, again, Dr. McGuire often says that we're like detectives looking for possible, possible causes for, for changes. And it's, so it may be a physical issue, maybe a social issue, maybe a, a psychological issue or a psychiatric issue that we really need to go looking for. And sometimes you just got to ask the patient. My, my favorite story on this is that a young man was brought in and lived in a residential facility, and, and this was when we still had paper charts. And, and I looked at what the nurse had written was whacking people. Whacking people. That's an interesting chief complaint, whacking people. So I went in the room and I asked, you know, what is this about? And, and, and he's, the, the, the staff person who was with him said, you know, every day at about 5.30, he walks into the living room and he punches his roommate. I said, wow, well, that's, that's not good. What's, what's that about? And, and uh, uh, so we talked about it a little bit. And, and I did something apparently that was, that was pretty unique. I asked the patient, uh, <laughs> what's this about? And, and what it ended up being is our, per, our patient with Down syndrome uh, was uh, not quite as socially savvy as his roommate. His roommate uh, was stealing his things, but doing it on the sly so that nobody knew. And our, and our patient, like many people with Down syndrome, he would ruminate about this for a while. And he unfortunately did not have the social savviness of his roommate. He would walk into the middle of the living room and punch the, 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 the roommate. Um, and so, uh, the, the, which was obviously very upsetting and not the correct way to handle it, but uh, he had no other way to communicate his, his problem. And no one had asked him, apparently. So uh, the staff was actually absolutely insisting that we put him on a medication, and that was not how this was treated at all. We just dealt with the social issue. And so, again, he was trying to communicate something uh, and, and just had not had an opportunity to, to share his story. And so once he had had that, it, it fixed the problem without medication. So again, our, 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 particularly my job is to, to look at the medical situation. We want to optimize physical health. Uh, particularly when there's a change, we want to assess for underlying or accompany, accompanying physical or medical conditions. We, want to, uh, we treat medical and psychological conditions as needed. And then we want to encourage healthy behavior. And we're going to try to talk about some of these here. So uh, this is, uh, uh, these two slides I could talk about 12 hours. So I'm going to try to shorten it and then leave time for questions at the end so that if you have specific questions. About 40% of our patients have an underactive thyroid, of hypothyroidism. You're probably aware that it's recommended that people with Down syndrome get screened for thyroid every year by, by blood test. Uh, about 1% uh, about of our patients have had hyperthyroidism, an overactive thyroid. Certainly not as common as hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, but more common than it is in the general population. Certainly hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, both can contribute to behavioral changes. It's, even for any of us, being hypo, having an underactive thyroid can cause depression. And for any of us, having an overactive thyroid can cause anxiety. And so certainly in, uh, we've seen folks uh, who've had both. What we often find as we look at these medical conditions, there may be a, it may be multifactorial. Uh, so for example, I'll give an example of someone that had hypothyroidism. Uh, the, pre the presenting complaint was he's not doing as well on his job at work. He worked in a grocery store, was, not, was having a hard time doing his job went back and looked at it, uh, he, he really looked depressed. And so we went back a, a step further and found that he had an underactive thyroid that was contributing to it. So we treated the thyroid, but that was not enough. At this point, there had been enough problems that he also had become depressed enough, he needed an antidepressant. And the third piece that was still not enough was now, because of what had happened, his relationship with his boss had been impaired. And so, actually, we set up a meeting with the boss and, and the family and the, and the young man with Down syndrome and sorted through that and, and sort of repaired that relationship and then we were able to get him back, back to his job. So it really was not enough to treat the physical issue, it was not enough to treat the psychological issue, and it was not enough to treat the social issue individually. You had to address all, all three issues uh, simultaneously. And that, that, again, that's a fairly simple example, but that's a very, very common thing of what we see on a, on a regular basis. Uh, hearing impairment is, is uh, more common in people with Down syndrome, and, and, and in adults, what we often see is that people begin to lose the high-frequency sounds. Tip, typical of what many of us do as we get older, we begin to lose high-frequency. People with Down syndrome tend to have this problem earlier, and what happens when we lose high-frequency sounds is that we have a hard time understanding consonants. So we may still be hearing the sounds, 
but we're not discriminating the words. And so, common example, a uh, person is brought in, uh, works, uh, work uh, site, the uh, person comes in with him and says, uh, you know, I, I think he's demented. You know, I, I think he's no longer following directions. He's, he, you know, I ask him to do something, he does something completely different. And you look and he, and he has hearing impairment. And, and like many people with Down syndrome, he, he's, a, he's a people pleaser. And so he, he hears words and he thinks he hears what he's hearing, and, but he does what he thinks he's heard. And he certainly doesn't want to displease the person by asking them 10 times what it is they're saying. So he just does what he thinks he's being told but it's not what he's actually being told, so, or being asked. So um, again, so he's not demented, he actually has hearing impairment. It's actually, we see a lot of earwax problems in our practice, very, very common, uh, and it's actually very refreshing when someone's brought in and the concern is that they're demented and you wash wax out of the ear and you cure dementia. It's, <laughs> it's uh, sometimes it's good for life to be easy. Uh, vision problems are also more common in people with Down syndrome, uh, particularly cataracts, and we see cataracts at a younger age. And again, we've seen some folks with some pretty dense cataracts that looked like they were developing dementia, that really what they were doing was developing cataracts. And so if you uh, uh, fix the cataracts, uh, they actually were, were doing much better. Keratoconus is an abnormal curvature of the uh, cornea. And the only reason I bring this up is it is a little more common. Um, there, there really is there's a couple treatments. One is hard contact lenses, which help hold the cornea uh, back into its original shape. We have a few patients that can do that, but not, not, too, not too many. Um, and, the, and the definitive treatment is a corneal transplant. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. And that's what I said 20 years ago. We have several patients who have had successful corneal transplants. So the only reason I bring this up is my message is, if you're in that boat, consider floating with it. Because we have had very good success with patients getting corneal transplants. And it's worked very well. And it's life altering. They really go from losing complete vision to the possibility of seeing well again. So I, I would, if that's, a, if that's a, one of the considerations and someone says uh, he has Down syndrome, he'll never be able to tolerate it, uh, tell him I said so, that uh, we've had some good success with that. Another thing that's, uh, another thing that's more common is cancer of the testicle and ovary. Uh, I think I have leukemia in there someplace. Leukemia is more common in children, uh, but the, incidence seem, the higher incidence seems to reduce by late teens, early 20s. So that's not so much of an issue of, of adulthood. But cancer of the testicle and ovary, we've actually had, I think, seven men with cancer of the testicle. So that's seven out of about 2,500. That's you know, one out of 350 or so. That's pretty common. Uh, fortunately, we've not had any, any women with cancer of the ovary, although it's thought to be more common. Cancer of the testicles, it's, it's a physical exam. You know, and so even in our folks that have a little hard time doing that part of the physical exam, I push for that every year very hard to make sure that we get that. If you've got to have a cancer, that's the one to have. Because it's, it's, if particularly found early, it's very curable. We've actually had uh, all seven of the men that we've had have been cured with, basically with, uh, uh, with early detection and, and surgery and, and in some cases radiation. Celiac disease is more common in people with Down syndrome. It's a sensitivity to gluten, which is a protein in wheat, barley, and rye. Um, it's one of those conditions, and, and I have uh, some friends that don't have Down syndrome that have celiac disease, and, and uh, they, you know, they tell me it, it can be subtle. And, and sometimes you don't realize, realize that you don't feel well until you get treated, and then you look back and say, this is health, that was not health, I didn't feel, now. only now do I understand that. And, and presumably, if, if someone with a, a normal intellect has a hard time sorting that out, imagine how much more challenging that can be for our patients. So um, it's something we certainly look at. Should we be screening everybody? It's, it's thought to be perhaps uh, two, three, four, ten times is more, more common in people with Down syndrome. Should, should we be screening everybody with Down syndrome for celiac disease? Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends everybody between the age of three and four. I'm not sure that recommendation makes sense because you can get it at any age. Um, but there isn't enough information to tell us whether we really should be screening or not. In fact, we're doing a study right now. Um, uh, our sense is that the, the, the blood tests that you, uh, are the initial steps for testing for celiac disease are, are not as accurate in people with Down syndrome as they are in other people. So we're, we're, we're trying to sort that out right now. I, uh, hang on to that one because I don't know that for a fact, but that's our sense. So we're going back to look at that. So I, I think the answer is out on that at this point. We don't, we don't really know what to do with that yet. Well, our approach has been you know, we typically think of celiac disease as causing weight loss and diarrhea, but if you look at the symptoms from celiac disease, it's a very lengthy list, including uh, fatigue, uh, mood change, behavior change, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So re really, just about anything that looks a little sideways to us, 
we're drawing blood tests for celiac disease just because it's, you know, we, we just think, particularly any of our folks that present with behavioral change, uh, we're testing, we test for celiac uh, or mood changes or things like that. As I mentioned, leukemia. Uh, sleep apnea, significantly more common in people with Down syndrome. It's recommended all kids by age four, I think the recommendation is, again, I'll take care of little ones, so I think that's the recommendation. All kids by age four get uh, a sleep study. Um, we certainly think it's common in pe adults with Down syndrome. I don't think we really know how common at this point. Um, the, the challenge with sleep apnea, uh, and basically in, in folks with Down syndrome, uh, that have sleep apnea, it's, it's almost always obstructive sleep apnea. So the brain is telling the body to breathe, but the airway gets closed off while they're sleeping, and so the air doesn't move. It's typically a, a loud snoring, uh, often followed by pauses, no snoring, and then oftentimes a snorting sound, and then breathe, snoring again, and then it stops and starts all night long. Uh, people say, well, he's not snoring, that must be the good thing. Well, that's usually the bad thing, because that's when they're not breathing at all. Uh, at that point, typically. So what happens is not only does it disrupt your sleep cycle, but your oxygen level drops down during that time, and that can, and it's obviously very hard on the body. Um, it's hard to look at a person and know for sure that they have sleep apnea without doing a sleep study. Uh, and, and unfortunately, sleep studies are not always easy, as I can, I can see some heads nodding, you've been there. Uh, sleep study is not always easy for any of, any of us, but certainly folks with Down syndrome. And then the treatment is not always easy as well. Uh, as far as using CPAP. CPAP is the, is the mask that blows positive pressure to help keep the airway open. Uh, that can be challenging for any of us to use and certainly for folks with Down syndrome as well. Um, there is a surgery option. Unfortunately, uh, we've had probably six or seven people with Down syndrome get the surgery and it, it unfortunately has not cured sleep apnea in any of them. Uh, and so they, they still needed CPAP. They, it, they improved but they still needed the CPAP afterwards, so it has not been cured. And we, we unfortunately had some pretty significant complications in at least two people that had the, had the surgery. So, um, so at the moment, there's not great options. I think, uh, I, I do say though, that we've had a number of patients with Down syndrome that all of us looking at the situation uh, going forward said, they're not gonna be able to do the uh, sleep study, they're not gonna be able to do the CPAP, and they're doing just fine, you know, and they're, they're doing very well. So we have a lot of patients that surprise us. So rarely do we give up before we've tried, and I would encourage you the same. So if you think that there's sleep apnea, uh, th then I would consider, consider doing the study and consider trying CPAP. We had a, a man that presented, for all intents and purposes, looked like he was psychotic. He was, he was having hallucinations. He was, uh, his uh, behavior was significantly different. His ability to function in, in his job was uh, markedly reduced. Um, and and I, as in the course of asking questions, the family said, you know, and, and he's gained some weight and he has been snoring more. And I, I think he might even be having some pauses in his breathing. And I said, well, you know, let's start with getting a sleep study. And, and it was very abnormal. He had a severe sleep apnea. He was able to use CPAP, and all of those symptoms went away. So he was back to his baseline. So it can, it can cause dramatic changes in people. And so it, it, uh, we certainly, have, if at all possible, if there's any thought that this person has sleep apnea, try to get a sleep study. And we certainly order a lot of them. And, and again, we have a lot of patients that are able to successfully get the sleep studies and successfully use CPAP. We certainly have patients that can't, but you know, we deal with those as we can. But I, I would certainly encourage to, to consider that as a possibility. Uh, cervical subluxation, which is or lantoaxial instability, which is the, the vertebrae slipping on each other. It's typically called lantoaxial instability, which is the first vertebrae slipping on the second, first cervical vertebrae, the neck vertebrae. It actually can be anywhere in the neck, and it actually can be in the, in the lumbar spine as well. And we actually had a patient that had it in the thoracic spine, the, the, the part of the, the spine that's attached to the ribs. So it, it can actually be, although the first on the second vertebrae is, is clearly the most common. Uh, part of that is probably because it's, it has to be the loosest because that's the one we use to turn our head. So it's, uh, it has to be looser, we wouldn't be able to turn our head. Um, so th th uh, this is uh, thought to be significantly more common in folks with Down syndrome. Um, the challenge is, uh, most of the time we talk about this, we talk about screening x-rays. And, and again, in the American Academy of Pediatric recommendations, most, the most recent ones that came out, they actually took this out. As a, as a screening, so that it's not recommended as a, the x-rays are no longer recommended as a screening. Uh, what they're recommending is uh, doing, uh, asking the, the questions about the symptoms, which would include things like weakness, you know, a weakness of the arms, arms dropping things, weakness of the legs, having difficulty walking, developing incontinence, uh, having difficulty walking, complaining of neck pain, 
uh, holding your neck differently, holding your head differently, things like that. Um, and then a good neurological exam every year, looking for weakness of the arms or legs, looking for changes in the reflexes and things like that. So we certainly do that every year. Um, for Special Olympics, which many of our patients participate in, they're still requiring the neck x-rays, although it'll be interesting to see what they do in the future based on the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. So for this point. But our issue really is, is more in our practice, is more the screening, is are our patients that have developed the problem enough that it actually starts to pinch the spinal cord. And so those are the patients we're looking for. And so we really recommend a good neurological exam every year, looking for the change in reflexes, looking for weakness to see if someone is developing, developing this problem. We had a young man who was, uh, nine, uh, oh, the other thing I should tell you, as, as our joints degenerate uh, uh, as we get older, we'll oftentimes develop some joint dysfunction. And in folks with Down syndrome, even if they didn't have cervical subluxation as a child, they can develop it later in life. So it's not a, it's not a once, never, always, never. Uh, as joints degenerate, we have seen people develop this that didn't have this uh, uh, younger. Two interesting stories about that. One is that a young man about 19 uh, presented with the complaint that he was uh, disinterested in school. That was the chief complaint. And, and we got the history was that he was, uh, he was included in high school. He was now putting his head on the desk at school and seemed very disinterested. The teacher was thinking that maybe this inclusion was not for him. And we looked at him and, and talked to him and, and found his reflexes were a little different, got an x-ray and he had cervical subluxation. Uh, he went to, uh, had an MRI, clearly abnormal, went to the uh, uh, spine orthopedic surgeon, had his neck fixed. And, um, and then was interested in school again, because he, he, the problem was he couldn't hold his head up all through the day because his, his neck was so loose. And so his, this was not a behavioral problem, this was a cervical spine problem. And, and then the other gentleman was, a, 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 tell the story, as another gentleman, he was in his 40s, uh, he lived in uh, central Illinois and presented with weakness of his left side, uh, and um, uh, he had a CAT scan of his brain that was normal, uh, despite that, they said, well, he must have had a stroke, nothing we can do about it. Uh, and so they brought him up to us and uh, did a neck x-ray, and he clearly had cervical subluxation, had an MRI, had abnormalities, uh, sent him to the surgeon, got his neck fixed, and, and he was, when I met him, he was in a wheelchair, and after the surgeon had uh, taken care of him, he was able to walk again. So um, if, they, if, if, if it had just been ignored, he would have just been a progressive problem until he was uh, you know, no longer able to walk at all. So I always joke with the residents and students, you know, if I present to the emergency room with sudden, you know, with weakness, you know, they're gonna probably CAT scan my head. And, and, and our patients, when they get in that CAT scanner, just stand there and push them in eight inches farther and make sure we're looking at their neck as well because we, we don't wanna miss something on our patients. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency is more common and some of that probably is, is uh, on the basis of uh, celiac disease. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and can cause a, a, a kind of a diverse uh, uh, neurological and psychiatric uh, changes in people. So anybody of our patients, again, that present with behavioral change, we're checking B12 to see if that's, uh, see if that's contributing. And we've seen quite a, quite a number of patients with B12 deficiency. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux, heartburn, uh, much more common in people with Down syndrome. Uh, interesting, we've seen a number of patients that had sleep problems that ended up being related to reflux. So they were getting reflux at night when they laid flat, and, and so then they would wake up because they were uncomfortable and couldn't tell us that. And so uh, thinking that if someone's having a sleep problem, that's one thing to consider. Reflux also tends to be worse in people that have sleep apnea. So if someone's having wor increasing reflux, again, that'd be something you might consider as a, as a contributing factor. Constipation more common. Uh, uh, as I'm just about to take a drink, uh, kind of reflexly, I am convinced that the great majority of our patients go through life at least mildly dehydrated. Uh, looking, at, looking at the patients, looking at the blood tests, our patients just almost as a, as a universal don't drink enough fluids. And certainly constipation is one of the complications of that. We've tried a lot of different things. We've tried checkboards where people, uh, they, they carry a little thing, on a uh, little, uh, folder, if you will, a little notebook with them that has eight glasses, eight pictures, picture of eight glasses of water, and they got to check it as they go through the day and make sure they get their eight glasses of water every day. So whatever it takes to get people to drink more water is important. Am I okay? Did you need something? All right? Okay. Um, we're till five o'clock. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, boils are more common in people with Down syndrome. Uh, and 
Um, this can be a significant problem for some of our folks. Uh, some of them uh, actually, again, uh, people with Down syndrome tend to have higher pain tolerance. So we see some pretty big, like a lot of knotted heads on that. I'll come back to that in just a second. Oh. Um, so we see a lot of people present with pretty large boils that they've not complained about until they're pretty significant. Um, I think it's probably three things. Uh, folks with Down syndrome tend to have dry skin. Uh, the immune system in many people with Down syndrome isn't what it quite, quite what it could be. And the third thing is uh, uh, hygiene is not always ideal in, in our folks. Uh, a lot of our folks uh, wash well and rinse well and then take what I call the zip-zip approach to drying. And so, you know, it's one swipe with the towel and, and on you go. A bacteria love to live in warm, moist, dark places, and that's typical where the patients have the problems. Thighs, buttocks, under the arms, along the abdominal folds, things like that. Uh, so uh, washing, first step is good washing, good drying, uh, good rinsing, good drying. Some people have taken to, to putting, you know, they get out of the shower and they, they have a tape there and they, they turn on a song. Typically in our practice, it's an Elvis song uh, for, you know, for 90 seconds and they dry during the course of that song or whatever it takes to, to make sure that they're giving, giving that adequate time uh, to, uh, it actually works well for teeth brushing as well, that the electric toothbrushes. I think the electric toothbrushes in our practice work well, probably more because they have a timer on them than, they, than, than the, the vibrating sense of the toothbrush. Um, just something to give people a, a time frame. Uh, time is a challenge, challenging concept for a lot of our patients, and so giving them some sort of concrete time frame uh, to, to do a task is, is, can be very helpful. Uh, particularly in the hot weather, and, in, and certainly these last, this last week here in Washington would fit uh, using powder, uh, particularly in folds and things, can be real helpful to prevent uh, boils. A couple studies suggest that uh, supplementing with vitamin C and zinc can help reduce infections, and so we often recommend that. Um, you can find that on our webpage, but it's 1,000 milligrams of, of vitamin C is what we typical, typically recommend, and 50 to 100 milligrams of, of zinc gluconate is typically what we recommend. And then some of our patients that just, all that, they try all that and it still is a problem. Uh, some of our patients, we will, a very few, but a, a, a select few, will put on a, a daily antibiotic similar to what you would use for uh, acne. Uh, just that's the only way we're able to keep it, keep it in check. We really try to limit that as much as possible on the, on the consideration that you, know, you put somebody on an antibiotic, eventually you're going to select out a more resistant bug. And so you, you, we try to limit that as much as possible. And then fungal infections are more common. A lot of the same reasons that people are getting boils, particularly the, 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 the drying and the hygiene issues. Uh, but again, probably the dry skin, the cracking skin, the uh, immune system issues are, are very common. Fungal infections, the toenails, are, are, are one of the infections that are very common. Um, for a lot of our folks, it really ends up being more of a cosmetic issue more than anything else. Um, uh, the uh, oral agents that are sort of the definitive treatment, the oral antifungal agents, can cause liver problems, although fortunately we've not seen that uh, happen. Uh, a couple moms have brought in articles that suggested uh, using Vicks VapoRub or tea tree oil every day to the uh, toenails. And I looked, you know, I, <laughs> in trying to keep a straight a face, I said, oh, sure, we'll, we'll give that a try. And you know what? It works. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Takes time, and, and uh, we've been doing it for probably 15 years now. Uh, it takes time. Uh, like any treatment, the fungal, uh, the toenails tend to grow slowly, and you don't really change the nail by doing that. You kill the fungus in the nail bed, and then the, then the nail grows out. It takes months, but, it, but it, it does work in many situations. And I'm not aware of any terrible, long-standing complication from uh, Vicks VapoRub other than uh, Terrible reminders of childhood having it rubbed on you. <laughs> uh, osteoarthritis is more common in folks with Down syndrome. And again, that's the wear and tear in the joints. The type of arthritis that we get is, is we typically get older uh, and after we've had injuries. Um, and and the, uh, uh, the interesting thing about osteoarthritis, in, in most people, the, the, the initial complaint of osteoarthritis is pain. And we don't see that very often or hear that very often in our practice, occasionally, but not very often. Mostly what we see is people who, who have joint dysfunction and their joints aren't working as well because of the advancing uh, arthritis. And, and I forgot to mention the pain issue before, so I'll, I'll jump in here. It's a common story in our practice that I'll, I've gotten a call or I'll see a patient and, and, and the mom or dad will say, or the patient will say, um, you know, I, I was playing soccer on, on Sunday and, and I got kicked and I went down. I was down for just a minute or two and I got up and I played the rest of the game. And, and then, you know, I was 
doing fine, and, and, and you know, now it's Wednesday, that was Sunday, now it's Wednesday, and uh, you know, I went downstairs, and, and I, I usually wear my socks when I go downstairs, and I didn't today, and mom looked at my ankle and said, Joe, man, your ankle is, that left ankle is all black and blue and twice the size of the other one. Well, what's that about? Well, I, don't, I don't know what that's about. It really doesn't hurt. Well, we better take you to the doctor, get an x-ray, and it's broken. And, and so, you know, it's, that's actually a fairly common story or some variation of that. So people with Down syndrome, I've been hearing for years, have a higher t pain tolerance. And actually, there's a mouse model for Down syndrome, if you will. It's a mouse that has an extra chromosome that has a lot of the, the similar health characteristics of people with Down syndrome. And they, I, I think they did this somewhere in Europe. I don't know that you could do this in the United States, but they, they gave those mice painful stimuli. And the mice with the extra chromosome had less response than the mouse with the normal, I don't know how chromosomes a mouse has, but uh, normal chromosomes had, had less uh, response than the mouse with the normal number of chromosomes. And so really that just confirmed what families have been telling us for 20 years. Uh, there's a lot of advantage to have a decreased pain tolerance. There's obviously some disadvantage as well. So people can walk around on a broken ankle for four days and make the situation worse because they weren't having discomfort. So uh, it does behoove us then to, to keep an eye on things to make sure that we're watching for possibilities. Uh, we probably do end up doing a little more testing uh, in our patients than you might in somebody else because, again, because of the pain tolerance and you, don't want, you want to make sure we're not missing something that might, have, might be causing some problems. And then the other thing I, I, I think is real important is what I call secondary disabilities. In our practice, it's probably most commonly related to obesity. And we're going to talk about obesity here in a second. But, um, and what I mean by that is that we have folks that have the cognitive ability to do things that then the obesity gets in their way and it makes it harder for them to do it. And so we really do uh, encourage uh, people to really work on, on uh, uh, keep it healthy, and we'll talk about that in a second here. Everybody take a breath. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. One of the uh, things that, that they uh, asked that I just uh, talked about briefly was the question of, is it autism? And I know Dr. McGuire, I think, talked about this this morning, so if you saw his presentation, you, you, but if you didn't, uh, just, just briefly. The diagnosis of autism is basically uh, uh, based on, on three things, impaired communication, stereotypic and repetitive behaviors, things like rocking or, or uh, flapping or, or arm waving, things like that, and then impaired social interaction. And Dennis, Dr. McGuire says, we really need to get rid of the term autism-like features because so many people with Down syndrome have impaired communication and so many folks with Down syndrome do repetitive things that don't have autism. And so we really got to be very cautious on, on call, calling that autism-like. In fact, perhaps in folks with uh, autism, we ought to call that Down syndrome-like features. Um, <laughs> because so many of our folks do that, and that's just, that's just part of who they are. The big issue is, is the impaired social interaction. And that really is, is uh, folks with Down syndrome that have autism. So many folks with Down syndrome that don't have autism are described as being very social and outgoing and, and affectionate, et cetera. That would be the big be the biggest difference in folks with Down syndrome and autism. And so most of our folks that have these autistic-like features, if you will, don't have autism. Uh, we do certainly see patients with Down syndrome that do have autism. Uh, but the, again, the, in our practice, the biggest thing that really nails it is the impaired social interaction issues uh, to look at. I think it's important, particularly for, for school and, for, and uh, for approach to the individual as far as helping them, to uh, manage their day, to look at, to understand that diagnosis if in fact they have it, and to work with them on that. Um, but I think for a lot of our folks, a lot of the same issues are beneficial even if they don't have autism. So uh, picture use of, we're gonna talk about pictures and use of uh, ver, uh, uh, picture communication and things like that are very helpful for in a lot of our patients even when they don't have autism. Uh, and it is, autism is thought to be more common in folks with Down syndrome than it is in the general population. But again, the great majority of our patients who have those features don't have autism. And so I, I just want to make sure people are reassured about that. Um, now, when oftentimes families will complain that when their son or daughter was, was born, they were given that first list of all those health problems that my son or daughter is going to have to deal with as they go through life. I think it's probably less likely that someone gave you this list. And I think this list is real important to look at as well. So we see some problems that are less common. We have about five patients in the practice that have high blood pressure. If it was the same as in the general population, it ought to be around 1,700. 
So high blood pressure is very uncommon in people with Down syndrome. I teach in the family medicine residency program, and, and typically those patients don't have Down syndrome, and the residents are always throwing at me this, the new, latest antihypertensive drug, and since I never prescribe them in our practice, I have to, I go, have to go look them up, because I, it's just not part of what I do on a, on a daily basis. <coughs> Coronary artery disease, heart attacks. We have one well-documented heart attack out of over 5,000 patients. Um, it ought to be significantly more than that. Now, granted, we've seen some folks that are adolescents in their 20s and 30s, you would not expect them to have, uh, have had heart attacks at this point, uh, but we do see early, eight, early aging issues, and we do see some other health issues at a younger age, um, and so perhaps we would expect that to be at a younger age if, in fact, it, it was going to be. So there does seem to probably be something about having an extra 21st chromosome that, that prevents you from having atherosclerotic diseases. I went to the autopsy of one of our patients that died in his 60s, and his, his arteries, except for one tiny little plaque and one artery in his heart and one tiny little plaque and an artery in his femoral artery, was as smooth as his tabletop. Even we know from way back in, when soldiers in Vietnam were dying in their eight, you know, late teens and early 20s, many of them already had plaques in, the, in their arteries. Um, so we know that a typical American will we'll get this process starting certainly before 60 in most cases. So there does, I mean, that's just a case of one, but I, I think it, it just certainly supports the sense that the atherosclerotic disease is much less common in people with Down syndrome. So uh, if one of our patients presents to the emergency room with chest pain, knowing that reflux is significantly more common and atherosclerotic disease is significantly less common, Although I say, go ahead and do the EKG, but let's be thinking much more likely to be reflux than it is to be a heart attack. Uh, and so uh, uh, one, uh, I think it's important to consider that. And the other thing that seems to be less common in folks with Down syndrome by and large is cancer. So colon cancer, breast cancer, uh, actually cervical cancer, and, and many of the solid tumors seem to be less common in people with Down syndrome. Someone asked me before we started is then, do you recommend colonoscopies? And I can tell you, our, our what we're doing at this point, we're actually doing a study right now looking at this um, in our practice. But we know that the incidence of colon cancer is very low in people with Down syndrome. In fact, out of, five, again, 5,000 patients, we have not seen any. And again, if people with Down syndrome have early aging issues, which we know that they do, and we see that they have other health issues at a younger age, we probably should, we think we're probably seeing this at a younger age, not at, not at a later age. And we're not seeing it at all. And so, if you look at the incidence being much lower, and a lot of our patients, when they get a colonoscopy, have to have general anesthesia. So the risk of the procedure goes up significantly. So we're very cautious about recommending colonoscopies on a screening basis. Now, a patient presents with bleeding or anemia or you know, abdominal pain, that's a different story. You know, so we you know, forge ahead and, and, and do what we need to do to make the diagnosis. Um, but just as a screening test, for all of us, it's recommended about age 50 that we get a screening colonoscopy. Uh, and so um, that's something we generally don't recommend for our patients when they get to 50. The other thing families say is that, you know, the risk of colon cancer, the risk of the anesthesia, anesthesia that isn't even our worry. It's trying to go through that prep that's the problem. <laughs> and, and having had a colonoscopy, I would agree 100%. Um, so I, I think it's just something to think about. As we go forward, Healthcare in the United States is changing. We're really looking at doing healthcare uh, on, on uh, you know, what they're calling is a pay for performance, if you will, meaning you know, pay for the qual you know, a quality rather than just on a quantity. And so as we look, go forward, um, you know, we really want to do every test that makes sense, but no more, and certainly not no less. And so, but as we go forward, we want to look at folks with Down syndrome and what are those tests that makes sense. And that's one of the things we're trying to do right now is sort through some of these things to figure these out and which tests. So a test that maybe makes sense for you and me may not, may not make sense for a person with Down syndrome. And a test that makes no sense for you and me may make sense for a person with Down syndrome because of the incidence of the different uh, conditions. And, and that's one of the things we're really trying to look, for, uh, look at as we go forward here over the next few years. So we talk about when we get health problems, how do, how do we prevent health problems? Um, one of the things we talk about, want to talk about is nutrition and exercise. Uh, there is um, a study, it was a study done several years ago by Nancy Roizen and others at the University of Chicago in kids with Down syndrome. And the easiest way I, I can explain this is the way that makes most sense to me is you've took two 10-year-olds, each weighing the same, one with Down syndrome, one without, sat them on a couch for 24 hours, didn't let them get off the couch. At the end of the 24-hour period, the 10-year-old with Down syndrome would have burned about two to 300 calories less than the 10-year-old without Down syndrome. 
Big deal, two to 300 calories. Two to 300 calories a day is 20 to 30 pounds in a year. So it adds up. So 20 to 30 pounds in a year is a whole lot in five years in, and on, on, on down the road. So the other thing they found in that study is if you just took out calories, you began to miss essential nutrients. And so it couldn't all be reduced in calories. At this point, there are some new drugs coming out, and I, I've not tried them anybody with Down syndrome, so I really can't comment at this point. But at this point, the only other thing we have, other than eat less, is burn more. And so you got to be active. So exercise is certainly one of the things. And as we talked about uh, yesterday in the, in the pre-con, um, it, it was certainly my sense, and the families almost to, to, a, to a person said, you know, group activities are going to be more, much more successful than expecting the person to go downstairs in the basement, walk on the treadmill while the rest of the family is watching TV and eating ice cream. It's just not likely to happen. We do have patients that that's not the case. We have patients that they're going to do their exercise on Tuesday night come hell or high water. I mean, they're, you know, they're just very, they have the groove to the, to the nth degree. But by and large, our patients will do better if, if it's a group activity. In fact, we did a study that showed uh, our patients that tended to be their closest to their ideal body weight didn't necessarily exercise but they had opportunity to participate in recreational activities. So just get moving. I run the Chicago Marathon pretty much every year, and I say the hardest part of the training is not the running, it's pushing the red button on the remote control and getting off the couch. Once you're going, you're, you're in good shape. There was a study that, again, had, it didn't have anything to do with Down syndrome, but it was done in the general population. If a family had a basketball hoop, the whole family tended to be closer to the ideal body weight. So the message was, again, just getting people out together and doing something, get, just getting out of the house. Whether it be going to the museum, walking along, you know, uh, whatever, it, whatever it be. In Chicago, uh, certainly people say, well, six months out of the year, I don't even want to go outside. Uh, use a we, use, you know, whatever it takes to, to and some, some of our patients have started to use we, a we and have done very well. And the other thing we want to, and I'm going to talk about one other thing that our folks really do in just a second here. But the other thing is we really want to encourage people to be their own motivation, particularly as our folks get out into adolescence and beyond, they, uh, you know, to have mom or dad tell them every day, you know, you should be exercising really ends up just creating a situation where it becomes a headbutting. So really putting it on a calendar, putting it on a schedule is really very helpful for our patients with Down syndrome to, to, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to stay, with, uh, stay on their exercise program. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. The other thing that's real important is, is sleep hygiene. Um, and by that I mean uh, we want to have a good routine. Uh, ideally, we should be going to bed. Uh, it's been shown in the general population, we really should be going to bed for optimal sleep, go to bed about the same time each night, and get up about the same time each day. Now, you know, this is a weekend, and typically that's not what we do. Um, but ideally, that's what you should be doing. And it should be about eight to 10 hours for most people. Um, and disturbance-free sleeping quarters. Now, this sounds. I mean, this sounds like it's so obvious, then why should we even say it? We have folks that live in residential facilities where they come in and they're having, you know, they're not doing as well on their work and they're having some behavioral challenges and we start digging and we find out that one of the jobs of the overnight staff is vacuuming. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, where is the surprise here, folks? Come on. So, you know, sometimes it's just something simple, you know, and, and you gotta go looking. But, but um, again, having a, a regular exercise and activities helps us sleep better. Probably not the hour before sleep, but any time before that is probably okay. Um, and, and avoid exercise in the late evening. And then avoiding caffeine in the evening. Actually, if you look at caffeine, it takes about 12 hours to metabolize caffeine. So for some of our patients, they probably shouldn't have it ever bre after breakfast. And for some of our patients, they probably shouldn't have it at all. If you have a sleep problem, you or the person with Down syndrome, the first thing I would recommend is get rid of the caffeine and then see what happens uh, and get rid of it altogether. Yeah, it's a good question. The question is about uh, light in a room. The person has fear of, of being in the dark. Um, and there actually are studies, again, done in the general population, not in folks with Down syndrome. But there are studies that, for example, having the TV on or a light on really does uh, interrupt sleep. So I would just try to make the light as minimal as possible and, and, and put, putting light on the person's face as minimal as possible and, and just do the best you can with that. Um, let's just talk a little bit about health promotion in, in the office. 
Uh, we recommend a good history and physical exam every year, and, and, and based on the things we've talked about, uh, you can get some sense of the things we're looking at. Uh, an annual thyroid blood test at TSH. A good neurological exam, looking, particularly looking for changes to, to suggest uh, cervical subluxation. Uh, again, the question of lateral spine x-rays, whether we should be doing those uh, uh, routinely is, is still a, a, an unanswered question at this point. A good hearing and vision test. There was a large study done in Scandinavia several years ago, and they found that every two years for people with intellectual disabilities was probably enough. Uh, some people get a hearing and vision every year. I'm, I'm not going to argue that point. I'm, I think the, the message is at least every two years, a person with Down syndrome ought to be getting a good hearing and vision test. We have seen over and over, we, we talked about the high frequency issue, we've seen over and over people that presented with loss of skills that the concern was dementia, that it was related to a loss of sense, particularly vision or hearing. Can I hang on to the questions until the end? Yeah. We're, we're getting there. Um, we recommend immunizations, flu shots, pneumonia shots. Uh, if you've been, what, had been too busy coming to the conference here and haven't seen, there's a lot of information now about pertussis being a real outbreak in the United States, whooping cough. Uh, and so it's recommended that all of us get a dip, the T and the D, which is tetanus and diphtheria, every 10 years. It's recommended all adults, the next time they get it, they get pertussis. And in fact, they're recommending, even if it's been less than 10 years, go ahead and get your Tdap now to prevent pertussis. The problem with pertussis is that there really is no good treatment. When you take the antibiotics, it's a bacteria, when you take the antibiotics, it prevents you from giving it to the next person, but it doesn't reduce the length of time that you have the cough, which can be months. So it's really no fun. And for, particularly for some of our folks that have heart problems or breathing problems, it's really not something we'd, we'd want them to have. Uh, hepatitis B vaccine, this is kind of a mute point for anybody that's about less than 25 uh, because uh, all kids with, uh, uh, in the United States are getting the hepatitis B vaccines as, as infants now. But our older folks, particularly those that are moving into residential facilities or working in work setting, you know, group work settings, we want to make sure that they've had hepatitis B vaccine, which is an infection of the liver. So let's just talk a little bit about, we talked, I talked a little bit about self-promotion, uh, health self-promotion, trying to encourage people with Down syndrome to do it on their own. Education, 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 education. It's common, we'll talk to a, someone in a residential facility and the staff will say, well, he has his rights. He can, you know, if he doesn't want to exercise or he wants to eat poorly or he wants to do this or that, he has his rights. And I, agree, I, I, I can't agree with you more, he has his rights. But that does not negate your responsibility to continue to teach and to encourage healthy behavior, uh, and, and also to um, model healthy behavior, imitation. Uh, I like to say that people with Down syndrome are a mirror, oftentimes, of behavior, and if we don't like what they're doing, we only got one person to blame. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, somewhat facetious with that one, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. People with Down syndrome will often are good imitators, and so it's a great opportunity to display healthy behavior if we want folks with Down syndrome to do healthy behavior. How do people with Down syndrome learn? They tend to be better, better visual learners than auditory learners. And so we're really very strong on recommending pictures and visual aids. A lot of people are now using uh, iPads as a, as a kind of a high tech version of this. A lot of our folks are doing very well. As I walked by uh, in the previous uh, session, there, somewhere along here, there was someone that was talking about um, using videos as a self-modeling. We have a number of families that, that will take a, a, mo a video of the person doing whatever the behavior it is that they're, they're shooting for, and then we'll show the person doing that behavior themselves as kind of an encouragement to continue to do that. Uh, the National Association for Down Syndrome NADS put out an aerobics video several years ago, and there are four people with Down syndrome doing the uh, aerobics exercises, and I sort of half joke that the four people who use that video the most are the four people who are in the video. Um, you know, when, when you go to a family outing and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people and you take a picture, whose photo do you look at first? We look at ourselves. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And folks with Down syndrome enjoy seeing themselves uh, on videos as well. So uh, I would encourage, that's uh, something that we've done and uh, encouraged in a number of situations as, a, as a, uh, a benefit. The other person is, and I don't know why, but Richard Simmons is God. <laughs> uh, in our practice, I'm not quite sure I get it, but I think Richard Simmons ought to be invited to one of these conferences. He would, <laughs> this room would be empty. He, everyone would be with Richard. The other thing is make it fun. 
Um, and we're going to show something here in just a second. So calendars. Uh, Use of simple calendars to, to encourage people to, to exercise. And a, lot, and a lot of our patients, if it's on a calendar, it's done. And, and if you've put something on your son or daughter's calendar, God forbid you don't do it, because you're in trouble. <laughs> they will let you know. Uh, people have started using iPads, simple checklists, things like that. Uh, this, the, this thing called, I think, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, it's W-O-B-L. It's a watch, it's a multi-time watch, so you can uh, set it off to go multiple times during the day. We've had patients use it to take their own medications, to encourage them to exercise, to do, to do a lot of different things so that they uh, stay on schedule. The visuals, uh, whether it be pictures or an iPad. We recently uh, got a small grant to buy some portion plates. Uh, and we bought some. If, actually, if you Google portion plates, when I, about a year ago when I went to put this, uh, put this uh, slide together, um, I uh, Googled portion plates, and there are more companies that sell portion plates than you, it's just amazing. I thought I was gonna find one or two. It took me half an hour just to find the one that looked like the one we had purchased. So portion plates, um, they just help give people a visual image of what a healthy portion is about. Now, if it's stacked six inches, you know, six inches deep on the plate, I think we've missed the boat. But, um, <laughs> But you get the idea. So we don't encourage people to like, take that out to a restaurant or anything, but if they start using it on a regular basis at home, they begin to get that visual picture, and then they, it helps them going forward. Um, we're actually, uh, uh, I asked when we got the plates, everybody that hands out a plate in the office, write down the patient's name and weight, and then at some point we're going to go back and wait and when we see them again and weigh them again and see if, in fact, it does seem to make a difference. But I think, it, at least from a standpoint of visually understanding what a healthy portion is, I think it's been helpful. I did have a patient in the other day, and the mom said, uh, you know, uh, Jim has lost five pounds. And then she, and I've lost three. So, <laughs> so it's helpful. So make it fun. And you'll see tonight, if you're going tonight, that, let's see if this works. Nah, it's not working. Oh, there we go. Dancing. I, I, I tend not to be a universalist, uh, so I say 99.999% of our patients enjoy dancing. D Dr. McGuire's okay with being a universalist. He, he's okay with saying 100%. So, um, This is at a conference recently in Wyoming. We are in Wyoming. Our folks love to dance. It's great exercise. Turn the music on at home. Six months out of the year in Chicago, snowing, ice, nobody wants to go outside. Turn on the music, and, and our patients, uh, by and large, love to dance, and it's a great form of exercise. So make it fun. And, and as uh, Dr. McGuire says, uh, he, he has yet to, uh, to really uh, see too many patients with Down syndrome that are shy. So uh, they're ready to go. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what time we got here. I'm going to kind of run through this so we can leave some time for questions. Um, one of the things they asked me to talk about was just briefly about sexuality and safety. I'm just going to uh, fly. I think Terry Cohaven is here this weekend. If you've had a chance to ever had a chance to, to see her present uh, or haven't had a chance to see her present, I would highly recommend you go to her presentation. She is outstanding. Uh, and again, uh, I, I get no royalties from her book. Go buy her book at Woodbine on, on sexuality. It is outstanding. And it is not only helpful, I, I found it helpful as a professional. I think it's helpful for parents. And there's a lot of uh, pictures and, and good descriptions in it that are very helpful for, uh, for people with Down syndrome as well. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. So common myths, people are asexual. This is clearly not true. Uh, they are, on the other hand, they are oversexed or uncontrollable. This is not true as well. Clearly, clearly not true. Uh, have increased needs for touch and affection. Yes, this is true for some of our patients, but it's certainly not true for all of them. Some of our patients actually are, are pretty tactile defensive, and so we have to be cautious and, and understand what their, what their individual needs are. Uh, they experience puberty later than their peers. Actually, uh, women with Down syndrome actually uh, start menses, start their periods earlier than, than the women in the general population. Uh, they lack the capacity to form lasting relationships. This, and, and you'll see tonight, uh, the other night we were in, um, in the pub over here having dinner and uh, uh, like 20 young people with Down syndrome had been on the hill, I guess, and, and came back. And a lot of them live uh, all over the place and they get together annually at this conference. And uh, it was, if you, had, you know, if you had blocked out their faces, it could have been any other 20 people walking in, the, in the, young people walking in the, in the restaurant the other night. It was just, it was fun to watch them interact. Uh, there was a study done uh, by the folks at the University of Illinois years ago when they closed the large state facilities in Illinois. Uh, they're almost all closed, we're getting there. Um, but this, these are the two big ones in Lincoln and Dixon, Illinois, actually where, where, my, uh, where Leo had lived. Um, but anyway, they, so they closed these facilities and they followed the people 
uh, after they move to these smaller facilities. And even the patient, even the residents who, to the, to the observer's eye, had no communication with the other people that they lived with, so they were severely disabled, had, had no uh, apparent communication with the other people. If they moved with the people that they lived with before, so if they lived, moved to the new place with the same people they lived with before, they actually did better and survived longer, lived longer. So there clearly was a relationship there, even in the f folks, to our eye, had no apparent relationship at all. So if that's the case, what, you know, clearly, uh, this, is not, this is not a correct uh, myth. Uh, common th the thought that people with Down syndrome are sterile, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, and, and are not capable of maintaining a marriage. And it's, uh, I, I um, just reviewed a, uh, uh, one of our patients had uh, passed away a few months ago, and his mother had, over the years, he, he was in his late 50s, his mother over the years had been writing a book, and then added a few chapters about, about the end of his life. She asked me to, to review it and then uh, write a... Um, like an introduction to the to thing, to the book, and I, and one of the one of the things that really struck me was, in the residential facility he lived in, which is really nice, twenty years ago, they had had a conversation about the possibility of him living, as a couple with his with his girlfriend, and they hadn't been able to figure it out then, and twenty years later we're still really no much further. Uh, for most situations with people with Down syndrome in residential facilities, so I, I think this is still a challenge. Um, you know, we really got to try to figure out some way that uh, how we can help support people in, in fully being included in life in all, in all aspects. So certainly the role of families, recognizing sexuality is a healthy and positive aspect of being human, sharing information. Certainly there's probably no area that where the issue of values comes up more than this. So certainly communicate values, share that, and, and let's, let's work through that and be up, up front with those. Uh, make information understandable. You know, how, how does the person learn best in other ways? And so let's, let's share with them uh, issues of sexuality. Use pictures or other multi-sensory techniques to try to help share information. Use simple, unsophisticated language so people understand. Uh, the, the, the story about uh, Johnny who asks his dad, you know, where am, I f you know how, where am I from? And dad goes through a lengthy explanation about the birds and bees. And then Johnny looks at him very perplexed and says, oh, well, Jimmy's from Ohio. <laughs> so. And understand where people are and, and address their, their issues. You know, and go back and check the understanding. Are they, you know, are, does the person understand? What is it, what is it that they're, they're, they're missing? And repeat, review, and reinforce. And this is true for anything. I hear all the time, well, we've taught him how to do such and such. And did you teach him again and again and again? I use a simple example. I go on the tollway in, in, in Chicago. And I go 55 when the policeman's sitting there. I probably don't go 55 when he's not. Uh, I probably would go faster if I knew he was never there. I need to be taught and retaught and reinforced. All of us do. So it's certainly true for our patients. And in the moment, teachable, you know, in the moment, teachable moment, certainly if a person is bringing up an issue, that's the best time to try to go over it because that's, that's the time they're going to learn the most. You know, it's like, uh, you know, you, you get all dressed up and you, you know, spend 20 minutes getting your coat on for a cold Chicago winter and then the question comes up, deal with it. Take the coat off and, and, and try to deal with it at all possible because that's the time that you're going to get the best learning. Respect boundaries, uh, certainly with regards to physical boundaries. Uh, consent may not be understood, but uh, permission is a, is a concept that people with Down syndrome tend to have, you know, uh, you give me permission to borrow your you know, thing. So that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a concept that a lot of our folks have a better understanding of. Um, and, in, and in a healthy relationship, the person you are dating will care about how you feel and won't want you to feel pressured or uncomfortable. And so that's something we want to get that message across. So if it feels bad, we want to encourage our, our folks with Down syndrome to, to understand and, and you know, listen to themselves. And, and if it feels wrong, uh, then, it's, then it's probably wrong. Uh, there's a great description of, uh, of that is, um, you know, if you're getting sweaty palms and, and you're, you feel lightheaded and, and you're getting dizzy and, and you're really nervous and, 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 you know, that's probably a sign that it's, you know, probably not a good thing. Geez, that describes every date I had in high school. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so fertility. Men do have a reduced fertility rate. Uh, there's actually three cases in the literature of men with Down syndrome fathering a child. Uh, two of the children were genetically normal. One is not reported, and it's not reported whether the woman had Down syndrome or not in, in the studies that were, I, could find, I found this in. So it, uh, the fertility rate of men does seem to be reduced. There are probably others 
Obviously, paternity is always harder to prove than maternity, uh, and so uh, there may be others that we're not aware of. Uh, women, the re there's a reduced rate, and that's probably based on reduced ovulation as well as a higher uh, spontaneous abortion rate or higher miscarriage rate. Um, in the literature, I could find 26 women having 28 pregnancies. Uh, 10 were normal. 10 of the, feet of the children were normal. 10 had Down syndrome. There was a set of premature uh, twins who died uh, at birth. Uh, three had some other uh, malformation. One had a s slightly smaller head, uh, and one was born stillborn. And then two, uh, the, the families or the patient chose uh, to terminate, and, and the, uh, uh, the fetus was, you know, what the outcome of the fetus was not known. So the key, if for no, another reason, you know, I, I think it's a value with regards to getting people more fully included in life. Um, <laughs> as one issue, but the other issue is we really want to help people to protect themselves. Unfortunately, people with Down syndrome are abused more frequently than, than other people, and so we really want to try to help. And the more people know ahead of time, actually, interestingly enough, helps them protect themselves and also helps them recover better when, they, when it does occur. And so teaching accurate terms for private body parts has been shown to be, be helpful. Uh, talking about body parts and instilling a sense of body ownership uh, that uh, so that uh, again get a sense that uh, you know that if someone else is uh, attempting to touch is not appropriate. Uh, helping your child read, interpret, and respond to their own intuitive signals. And again, we talked about the sweaty palms and whatnot. Um, okay, so that was kind of a rule, but I, I wanted to just quickly touch on that because I think it's really important from a safety standpoint and from a standpoint of it's been shown, and we've certainly found in our practice as well when people have been abused if they have some sense of what's, what's right and wrong with, with the, that situation ahead of time, they're able to recover better uh, after the fact. So let's start on a little more upbeat note if we can. Uh, healthy living, education and re-education, over and over. We want to support people and teach them uh, and, and, and be a good example of healthy behavior. We want to encourage regular exercise, aerobics, a little bit of weight training, some stretching, uh, encourage healthy diets, uh, encourage healthy sleep, uh, maybe a vitamin D supplement. We didn't talk about that, but uh, vitamin D deficiency does seem to be a little more common in people with Down syndrome, so considering vitamin D supplementation. Um, and then retirement for some of our older folks. Uh, a lot of our folks live in residential facilities that if they have to go to some work program during the day in order to live in the residential facility, you know, uh, you know some of our folks are in their 60s and 70s, uh, and, and you know, I hope I have the option at least to retire someday, and, and our folks should have that as well. I heard a great thing on the radio a number of years ago, we should retire to something, not from something. And so certainly we don't want people just to retire and sit at home and do nothing. We want them to have opportunities to participate in life, but we don't want to force them to continue. You now some of our folks get up at you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, get on a bus for an hour, go to work. You know, you know when I'm 90 years old, I hope I'm not, that's not the expectation. And, and, and so certainly for our folks, we would hope that's not the case as well. But we want them to be, continue to be cognitively stimulated and to, and to stay, stay uh, active. And then the other thing, just as a, as a last thing, we, we really encourage the opportunity to do for others. Our folks with Down syndrome love to do for others and are very good at it. And we uh, see some patients from a uh, large campus facility uh, in Chicago, and the folks come in beaming and say, last week was my week to push the wheelchairs and what they're talking about is the folks with cerebral palsy who are not able to manipulate their own wheelchairs. Great sense of pride and satisfaction. A lot of patients that do volunteer work, do a wonderful job, are very good at it. Um, and so particularly in this economy, where 50% of people with a disability are unemployed, looking for volunteer opportunities to people can do something for somebody and, and to keep people active and, and healthy is really important. So I'm going to stop and let's, uh, let's open it up for some questions. And I, I, the question is, is, is it more likely that someone with Down syndrome that had heart disease as an infant is, has scoliosis? And I've never heard that before either. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry.
Yeah, the question is, uh, if, if since people with Down syndrome tend to have a higher pain tolerance, as they get older, if they are complaining of pains in their joints, should it be checked into? I would say absolutely. I would look into that. Yeah, I, I can tell you my approach is if, if it's a if it's a big complaint, you know, I, I might get an X-ray just to see. But oftentimes, what I'm doing, you know, I, I think. The job of the future is going to be physical therapy as we all get older. Uh, I think so many of these mechanical problems need mechanical solutions. And so I do a lot of referring to physical therapy to help people with optimizing the use of their muscles around the joint. Um, you know, there's, there's only so much you can do with a joint that's damaged. Uh, you know, for pain, you can take anti-inflammatories, you can take Tylenol. Um, but if we can do everything we can, I, I become convinced of this personally as well as professionally, if we can do everything we can to keep the joints stretched and the muscles around them as strong as possible, uh, I think people do better. I'll give an example. Uh, several years ago, I was running, training for the marathon. I was running 50 miles a week, and I'd hurt my knee, and I could watch the muscle in the, my distal thigh shrink from day to day. And I'm running 50 miles a week. So clearly I was doing something different because of the injury favoring that leg. So really what you need, I needed specific exercises for that muscle to keep it strong. So I think that's what a lot of us need for arthritis as, as we go forward, is we need to, to optimize the, the function of the muscles around the joint so that the muscles do more of the work and the joint does less. And that's very simplistic. I'm sure a physical therapist could give you an hour explanation of why that's the case. But I'll give you the 10 second version uh, because that's all I know. Um, <laughs> but but, I, but I, we've seen it work over and over and over in our patients, getting therapy and then, and then taking those recommendations and doing that on an ongoing basis at home. Yeah. You know, the question is whether uh, high frequency hearing loss should be picked up in a regular hearing test, and, and yes, it should be. Yeah, yeah they're, they're checking um, a broad range of uh, frequencies in a, in a typical hearing test. To follow up on that, is it, have you found it successful to have it aided? Uh, have a good question, good question. Uh, hearing, about hearing aids, uh, and yes, we've had a number of patients, we have a lot of patients that have hearing aids, and it does, it can really help with the, with all frequencies, but can help with the high frequencies so that understanding is better uh, as long. Some of our patients do find hearing aids challenging, but we have a lot of patients that do remarkably well uh, uh, in managing hearing aids. Many, 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 many. So I would encourage it. Yeah. Questions about the, the TSH number? Um, generally, we use the, the norm that's the same norm as the, for the general population. And that from lab to lab, that'll vary. So if, one, if it looks a little different from lab to lab, that's okay. You just want to look at what their normal is. And so you want to fit it within the, in their normal range for the lab. Some people with Down syndrome will, their TSH will go a little high at times and then we'll come back to normal. And so it's something you keep an eye on. In addition to seeing the TSH, particularly in that situation, you'd be looking at the T4 and perhaps the T3, which are the, the TSH is the hormone that the brain produces to tell the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. And the thyroid hormone that's, that we measure are the T3 and the T4. So if the TSH is a little elevated and the T3 and the T4 are normal, in that situation, it, it isn't necessarily to, to treat uh, with the thyroid medications, you would just watch and see if it returns to normal. There is a study that shows that if you, in that situation where the TSH is high and the T3 and or the T4 are normal, that you can actually do thy draw thyroid antibodies. Antibodies being uh, what the body is making to actually attack the thyroid. And in most people with Down syndrome that have thyroid problems, it's because the body is attacking the thyroid. And so if the thyroid antibodies are positive, that study shows that those people are, are likely to go on and develop a worsening of the thyroid situation. So the TSH is likely to continue to go up, and the T3 and the T4 are likely to go down. 
So in that situation, what we'll do is if the TSH is a little bit elevated, the T3 and T4 are normal, I will typically draw thyroid antibodies. And if they're elevated, then I'll talk to the family. I say, this is likely that this is going to go on to be, become worse. We can either start the medication now or we can keep a close eye on it and watch for it to get worse. And, and then we just have a discussion and decide what the best way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that in, in folks with recurrent infections, looking at the zinc and the vitamin uh, vitamin uh, C supplement is something to think about. If if the diet is not what it could be, a good multiple vitamin is not a bad idea. Um, but I think looking, you know, the more we learn about vitamins, I think the more we know that we don't know about vitamins. In fact, there was a recent study in the, again done in the general population in older women. Uh, the chance of dying was greater if they took a vitamin, a multiple vitamin, than if they didn't. So I, I think I think that that. The, the, the easy answer is that there isn't one, and I think we need to keep, keep looking. But generally, we'll recommend, if people are not eating a healthy diet, we'll go ahead and just recommend a, a, one multiple vitamin a day. <coughs> go ahead. Look. Yeah, the question is about folliculitis. Oftentimes, the uh, folliculitis is infection of the hair follicles, and oftentimes, the recurrent boils are an extension of the folliculitis. And so I would approach it the same way. The other thing I'm a big proponent of is a, is a soft brush on a handle. A lot of our patients, based on arm length and body size, have a hard time reaching uh, spots that are most vulnerable to that. So uh, at home, it's the Bed Bath & Beyond. I say, go buy a $5 brush at Bed Bath and & Beyond and, and use a liquid antibacterial soap and go to it. And rinse and dry. Yeah. Question is about uh, two th two questions. One is about asthma. Actually, uh, in adults, we actually seem to see less asthma than in the general population. And people that take care of more kids, they do see it, but we we didn't tend not to see it a lot. And the other is teeth grinding, which is one of the great mysteries of life. Um, one of the things about teeth grinding is is really looking at the going to the dentist, and and a, a mouth guard can help prevent. A tooth damage, but the more that I talk to the dentists, a lot of the teeth grinding is probably related to malocclusions and other other uh, um, you know uh, mal malformations of of the of the teeth and the jaw and whatnot. So I would go look. You know, people ask, well, uh, braces, uh, palate expanders, and all those things are those going to help? I think that you know this is really the first generation, or maybe the first and a half generation that really is, has the advantage of having those things offered to them. So I don't think we have any long-term information as to what the benefit of that is, but certainly we know from the rest of the population that all those things are helpful and, and, and help people chew better, they have less dental decay and gum disease down the road. So my, my sense is, um, you know, let's go to it. And, and I, I think there was a discussion yesterday at the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group about high palates and how that may actually impact uh, sleep apnea. So I, I think the whole issue of palate expanders and, and braces and things going forward uh, are going to be uh, very interesting to see how it impacts on some of these things. The other thing I think people often ask is, uh, is whether occasionally people come in and say, you know, that it's been proposed that their jaw be cut and it be, uh, you know, altered. Again, I, I mean, Braces and palate expanders is one thing. I, I don't think we have a lot of information on that, and, and that clearly is a s much bigger deal than braces and a palate expander. So that I don't, I mean, I just don't have information on that to share with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So there's an example of uh, someone who had the jaw surgery, and, and, and actually one of the advantages was uh, uh, to the d digestive system. And, and I didn't talk about this, but a lot of our folks, you know, like a, the zip-zip approach to drying, I like to give everything a name. And so a lot of our folks do what I call the one and down, one chew and down it goes. Uh, and so, um, there, I mean, there's all sorts of things that causes, but gastrointestinal problems, our, our gastrointestinal system is not designed to, to have pieces this big, you know, in the small intestine. That's just not the way it's supposed to be. Have you found uh, good teeth to be something uh, Yeah. My daughter's 37. She just last year had her very first tiny, itty bitty uh, 
cavity. Yeah. 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 The question is about uh, incidence of cavities. It's thought that the incidence of cavities are, are, are less in people with Down syndrome, although some people argue that those studies are older and were done in, res in large state facilities and the people never had uh, candy. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, but I can tell you, even in our younger folks, the incidence of cavities seems to be less. Unfortunately, most of us end up losing our teeth because of gum disease, and that's more common in people with Down syndrome. So good hygiene. Flossing, and then again, I think looking at this whole issue of malocclusions, you know, the, the, the teeth overlapping, dental care, uh, orthodontal care, I think going forward is going to be real important. <laughs> Vitamin. Uh, questions, uh, yeah, if you got it, I think we're around about five o'clock. I can stay, but if you do have to go, please feel welcome. Um, question about vitamin D deficiency, the cause. Probably the most common cause is. Um, uh, lack of sun exposure. Uh, we, we are designed to be out in the sun and, and we make vitamin D by being out in the sun. Uh, in Chicago, I went to a conference recently, a rheumatologist said you could lie outside naked all, all winter long in Chicago and not absorb enough sun. Of course, <laughs> they'd put you in the loony bin, but uh, th that's a different issue. Um, so it, I think a lot of it's just sun exposure issue, and we've gotten much more aggressive with using sunscreen to prevent sun can or, or, uh, skin cancer. So um, I think that's one of the issues. I think some of it's diet. Um, it's hard to get enough vitamin D in the diet unless, unless you're drinking vitamin D fortified foods like uh, milk or drinking milk. Uh, um, and then the other thing is some of our patients, it's probably related to celiac disease. So uh, that'd be the other consideration. Yeah, the question's about phlebitis and vascular. Are you talking about um, a deep venous thrombosis? Yeah. Yeah. Question's about a deep venous thrombosis, which is a, you know, basically a blood clot in the larger veins. We're not actually having the fat, but I mean, you know, it's never, it's always tested negative for mm -hmm. but he has the pain and the swelling. Yeah. The, okay, so there's two parts to that question then, actually. Um, the question's about um, venous disease, basically. Um, so we see some huge varicose veins. I mean, I'm talking about big ones. And, and, and we know that the connective tissue of people with Down syndrome is not quite right. I mean, that's probably some of the reason for some of the congenital heart disease and some of the other problems that people with Down syndrome have uh, structurally, if you will. And so we see some very large varicose veins. For a lot of our folks, they're basically asymptomatic. They may be asymptomatic because they have a high pain threshold, or they may be asymptomatic because they're not having symptoms, and I don't know why. Um, so for a lot of our folks, just um, you know, encourage them to keep their feet up when they're sitting, and, and you know, not, if they're standing for a prolonged period of time, you know, uh, walk back and forth and things like that. Um, a lot of our folks will not wear compression stockings. Um, so you know, and the time they need them the most is in the summer, and the time they're least likely to wear them is in the summer. And so I, that, that's one issue. So the other, the other thing is with uh, blood clots in the, the deep venous thrombosis. The, uh, the interesting thing is um, people with Down syndrome are thought to have more, more autoimmune conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, although we've not, we've not seen it. The thyroid is probably an autoimmune uh, condition in people with Down syndrome. Celiac disease probably has an autoimmune component, and the list goes on. And, and, and one of the complications of a lot of autoimmune conditions are, is increased blood clotting. And we became aware of that in a couple things. One, we had some women with Down syndrome that got on the pill that developed blood clots. And, and as we began to look at that, we thought, this seems like it's happening more commonly than it would be in somebody else. So when we do start people on, obviously that's not your son's issue, but when we do start women on the pill, we're pretty aggressive about looking at blood tests to see if there is, they have an increased in incidence of some of these conditions that cause increased clotting. And if they do, we don't put them on the pill. Um, so I think that, so uh, the answer to your question, I think, is uh, varicose veins certainly can contribute to discomfort and addressing those uh, with, uh, you know, keeping the feet elevated, uh, walking when their people are standing in one spot, you know, every hour or so, uh, compression stockings if they'll wear them, but also being aware of the possibility that, uh, again, it's not, not clearly proven, but it, it, to us it seems that blood clots probably are more common. Phlebitis. And that would be a complication. Uh, inflammation of the vein would be a complication of the varicose veins at times. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Um, the question is about uh, if you don't live in Illinois, what, what, what are your options? There, I would, first I would go to the National Down Syndrome Society, not the Congress, but the Society webpage, and they have a list of clinics by, by state. Um, and, and that internationally as well. So I would, I would start there to see if one's uh, nearby. Um, the second part of the question was about, you know, is there um, some way to support a physician that doesn't, you know, isn't running a clinic? Um, in the back of our medical book is, is basically what I would call a, a recommendation checklist of, of screening tests, the ones I recommend and don't recommend and why. Uh, so that'd be a starting place. We are in the process of, uh, we have a web page, and I'll take a look at that. We're in the process of, of looking at ways that we might uh, beef that up as well as develop uh, a curriculum uh, for uh, not only our residents and students that rotate with us, but also that could be used um, for by somebody that's you know, in practice. The other thing we're really looking at is I, I practiced in a small town before I did this, and I get that if you've got one or two patients in your practice that have, that have Down syndrome, you're probably not going to read the 800 pages of our books you know, for one or two pages. So we're really trying to be aware of that and, and see if we can't streamline that for a practicing physician so that it's very easy to, 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 to get information like that. And, and we're, as we go forward, we're really trying to put that on our web page. There is some information, but it, we've got a ways to go. Yeah, we, the question is about um, uh, adrenal insufficiency and polycystic ovary disease. I would put that more in an, in an endocrine uh, issue rather than a gynecological, gynecological issue. Uh, we certainly have seen some polycystic ovary disease. Uh, I mean, clearly it's because it's, it's the cysts in the ovary, but the, the big issues end up being endocrine. Uh, and so uh, trying to deal with the hormonal issues. Um, and actually, we have treated some patients with polycystic ovary disease with metformin, which is a medication that uh, is used for diabetes and that actually can help prevent diabetes and can help women in that situation uh, actually um, uh, improve their weight situation and also potentially prevent diabetes. Is that, do you recommend that? It's something that we, I think it's, it's worth a discussion and we will typically offer that. It also greatly impacted her yeah, her sounds more like a, a multiple endocrine, and, and it is not uncommon for people with Down syndrome to have multiple endocrine issues. So, certainly something to think about. Yeah, good question. I, again, we didn't have time to talk about everything, but osteoporosis is thought to be more common in people with Down syndrome. Um, so certainly uh, regular exercise. There, there's a whole debate now on calcium supplementation and osteoporosis, so at least at this point we're still recommending people uh, get enough calcium throughout their life. Uh, and regular exercise, uh, weight, regular uh, weight-bearing exercise is important uh, from that standpoint. Uh, yeah, the question is, have we treated people? We've treated quite a few patients with medications to try to reduce, uh, to improve uh, osteoporosis. Absolutely. Would we treat them sooner? Uh, typically, it, it's... Oh, screen them. Would you screen them sooner than? Uh, typically, uh, you know, you think about screening women as they go th beyond menopause, and menopause does occur at a younger age in women with Down syndrome. So, in a sense, yes. The other, the other people to screen are those on seizure medications because seizure medications increase the risk of uh, osteoporosis. So that would be something else to consider. The other people to consider screening for osteoporosis are those with celiac disease because that's associated with osteoporosis as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the question is about lordosis as well as a stress fracture. Yeah, I would, I, I would, you know, regular follow-up with the, the, I was seeing a spine surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, I would just, you know, regular follow-up with the pediatric orthopedic surgeon is what I would recommend. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> 